Hi everybody, welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graven and we're joined today by Phyllis Quinn. She is a consultant and a speaker and a professional coach. Um, she's an author and she's the CEO of MFW Consulting Professionals. She has a BSN in nursing and a PhD in healthcare administration. And her book is titled Bringing Shadow Behavior into the Light of Day. So I know we'll be able to talk about the book and have a great conversation here today. Phyllis, thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm fine, Mark. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, sure thing. Um, thinking to your work and career, Phyllis, um, what would you say is your favorite mistake? So the, the mistake I learned the most from, which probably qualifies it as my favorite mistake, mm -hmm. is the decision to take on uh, a staff member's disruptive bullying behavior on my own, uh, mm -hmm. feeling very competent, feeling very confident that I was going to follow this rule, that rule, step by step, um, didn't weave in human resources, didn't weave in administration until the situation got out of hand. And then I, mm -hmm. I you know, learned a, a, a very, very severe lesson from that experience. It's my favorite mistake because from it, um, I've learned so very much and hope to share with your listeners tonight. Well, that, that certainly is what would qualify a mistake, I think, to be a favorite mistake. It's, it's all about the learning and the reflection. Um, maybe we can go back and, and, you know, I think there are probably some details from the scenario that, that you might be able to share with us. Um, I mean, can you talk about like what some of that behavior was? How did you discover that this was um, a problem? Yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, one of the, the things that's really important when you are a leader and particularly important when you're a leader in healthcare is that you try to create the healthiest work environment you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And the, the goal of all of that is to decrease the amount of distractions people have so they can focus on what they're doing. Now for clinical people, that might be a bedside procedure, uh, doing some wound care, perhaps medication administration, but it takes a lot, as you can imagine, in the 21st century to be a clinician. Mm -hmm. So when you have behavior that isn't overt, it's shadow types of behavior that, you know, are, are in the realm of plausible deniability, but take mm. the toll on the stamina and the well-being of the staff, um, you, you have to address that or you can have as many seamless procedures, policies, you know, methodologies as you want. Um, the foundation of a healthy work environment I have come to find out is effectively assessing and managing disruptive behavior and making sure you have zero tolerance for anything other than that. Yeah. And so when you say shadow behavior, this is, and, and we'll talk more about this, you know, we'll talk about your book, but you know, in the case here, this is not overt name calling or bullying or throwing things at people this was kind of just more 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 passive in, in the, more in, subtle in more the, passive aggressive or yeah in the case where you know i learned my lesson you know my favorite mm -hmm. mistake um it was behavior that was reported to me as and it had a pattern you know, um, which which is important to understand. People, you know, it's not just episodic. Anybody can lose their stuff or be uncivil or have a mm -hmm. bad day. Okay, we're not sure. talking about that. We're talking about a pattern of behavior that over time starts to suck the energy out of the department and out of the individual perhaps being targeted. And that was what was happening. There was one or two individuals that were being targeted. There was a pattern with this mm -hmm. particular staff member of really going after our newer staff members on that unit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like you're not going to have a real job until you get past me kind of thing. Yeah. And it was never said overtly. And it, it was always said with the flair of, you know, uh, plausible deniability. Oh, she misunderstood. He, uh, he misunderstood. Mm -hmm. That's not what I meant. I was just trying to be... I meant it as a joke. They took it personally. They better toughen up or they're not going to make it. Mm. You know, it was never the person, you know, being the bully's mm. responsibility. It was always everybody else misunderstood me. 
I'm a victim. Yeah. And so once that was reported to you and you were aware of it, I mean, thinking back, what do you think led to you trying to address it on your own as you, as you described? So, you know, I, I try to have a style of, well, you know, most of what we disagree on or most of what our issues are probably can be solved over a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I first attempted. I sat down with this person and, you know, I said, can you have a cup of coffee with me and let's just talk. And I just want to give you some feedback, growth and development type of, mm -hmm. you know, um, feedback that, you know, I'm hearing this and, you know, well, that's not what I intended. And I said, of course not, which is why we're talking. I want to raise mm -hmm. your awareness that this particular pattern of behavior Right. Um, could lead people to see you in a light that you don't want to be seen in. And um, that person then promised me the sun, the, the moon, and the stars, told me exactly what I wanted to hear. And I came away from that experience thinking that I had done just-in-time intervention or just-in-time coaching. It was a teachable mm -hmm. moment. We both came away, hopefully, with a, 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 a more solid relationship only to find out two days later that she reported me for harassment to human resources. She went to HR before you did. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. Yes. This sounds like somebody who maybe knew how to play the system a little bit or had been getting away with this for a while. And, and you're going to find that that, that happens, that most mm -hmm. bullies on the unit are not newbies. They mm -hmm. are, you know, um, part and parcel of the fabric of the department. People know about it. They don't talk about it. This has been going on for a while. Everybody, wink, wink, nod, now, nod, knows that this person's an issue. Um, and But nobody has either the wherewithal, the desire to take it on, or they're frightened. And you have then fear-based leadership, and everybody looks the other way. And And, of course, then that person feels empowered. They feel powerful. And the the behavior then escalates. It doesn't get mm. any better. Um, but it was a, it was a, you know, rule number one for what I outline in my book: never take a bully on by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, when you have a situation, you start documenting it so that you can have dates and times that talk about a pattern of behavior, not a rare moment, not somebody having a bad day, but a pattern of behavior. And then you have a sit down with administration and human resources so that you can have a coordinated action plan on addressing this. And if you don't have everybody's buy in, hopefully human resources and administration will say you don't have something yet. We'll have to wait a little bit longer. Try this. Try that. And you do. OK, but, at, you know, as time goes on, you'll find that, you know, all the. Um, de declarations that I have mended my evil ways. Thank you for investing mm -hmm. in me. I understand now. I really enjoyed that training. You know, all mm -hmm. of those things are just a matter of placating you so that you will look the other way and then at some mm -hmm. point in time that behavior will rear its ugly head again. But this time everybody's been read in. So again, please never try to address bullying behavior on your own. You must have the coordination of administration and human resources in order to have an action plan that will not just address the issue, but keep you safe while you're doing your job. Yeah. So in that scenario, you described an approach to me. It sounded like you were trying to be, you know, a, a coach um, that you were giving that bully maybe the benefit of the doubt. And like, mm -hmm. here, let me help you be aware you um, yep. like it's not a very nice word on my part but clueless they might have been clueless right versus right. like how often do you think that that uncivil bullying behavior is something uh, more malignant or malicious yeah so i'm glad you brought that up mark because um the the incidents of bullying behavior not just there's there's actually two types of disruptive behavior Chronic incivility, and we can talk about that, but to mm -hmm. get to the, your question, actual bullying behavior, bullying behavior being d defined as behavior that's abusive, behavior that's mm -hmm. targeting an individual, undermining their confidence, belittling them, where it is so pervasive um, that the person, you know, 
no longer wants to come to work or they start to have some somatic complaints around the stress of having to work with this individual. And you would, you know, the, 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 the paradox is, is you would think that in a caring profession, such as healthcare, mm -hmm. um, that this wouldn't happen. We're all professional caregivers when in fact um, it is pervasive and um, mm -hmm. not to the point where it's 50%, but from the, from speaking across the country to nurse executives, um, we're pretty much in agreement that about 5% of our staff indulges in what we would call that type of bullying behavior. Wow. Um, kind of like the analogy of why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Uh, the piece is, is, you know, if you have a personality that needs to be condoned or somebody needs to, you know, care for you, nurture you, invest in you, want you to do better, and you're playing that caring personality like a fiddle because mm -hmm. all you're doing is telling that caring person what they want to hear. They feel as though they have done their job of caring and being a good transformational leader so well. And then they just go right ahead and continue mm -hmm. doing that. And what you've done is actually um, push the finish line further. The mm -hmm. odd thing here, and probably the most destructive thing to leadership, Mark, is that the there's 85% of the staff that's actually ready, willing, and able to show up and do world-class care and act in a collegial manner. And they're standing right. there watching leadership get sucked in here. And mm -hmm. they're thinking, what part of this don't you understand? This person is a problem. And yet right. you want to believe otherwise. You want to believe that you have the magic ingredient to turn this person around. But when it comes to bullies, who I usually define as narcissists with a license, mm. there is no turning around. There's no remediation. The action plan is getting them to the door. Now, it might take yeah. a while. It might take a mm -hmm. year or two, depending on how long that person has been with the organization. But there is no turning that person around. Yeah. Um. When I think, uh, so when you describe this as pervasive, you know, I've done consulting work with hospitals um, across the United States for 15 years. And, and this issue does come up a lot when we talk about we're working with leaders and, and trying to create a more respectful workplace. The stories of the bullying, unfortunately, come out. Some of it seems to be professional hierarchy within silos, um, older physicians, toward the residents or toward the younger physicians, um, older nurses toward the newcomers. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this phrase of, of nurses eat their young. Oh, yes. I'm trying but, to stamp um, that out. Yes, I've heard it. Yeah. No, and, and, and I appreciate that you're working on that. Right. Um, but it's like, true. Not to make, and, and not to make excuses for anybody, but trying to think of why some of this happens. I mean, I wonder how much of this flows through. Oftentimes, physicians might bully nurses or other professionals in the workplace. And then I wonder at some point when, um, you know, someone's been harmed in the workplace that it sort of gets passed along. If a senior nurse gets bullied by a physician, the senior nurse thinks, well, I can bully a junior nurse or I can bully uh, a tech. Yeah. Um, again, not to make excuse for it, but just trying to think right. of how systemic some of this right. might be. Um, I, I understand the point you're trying to make and, and my experience and my, my, my speaking with nurse executives and other executives around the country um, proves that, you know, it brings up a different point. The person being mm -hmm. targeted doesn't go on to target. Okay, ah, that that okay. that that doesn't happen. Um, we have to understand that again. Bullying, narcissism with a license. Okay, is all mm -hmm. about power. All right, uh, you have a very frail ego that needs to make sure that everything leads to this person. It's all about me. It's all about me. Mm -hmm. They lack that mm -hmm. gene of empathy. There's no way they can connect with the harm and damage that they're doing because they frankly don't care. Mm -hmm. um, the the if it's so if it's about power you mm -hmm. you bring up the incident of the of the physician and i can say that you know physicians and surgeons are the financial engines of the hospital mm -hmm. and they bring in money and they're not only in that hierarchy but there's a financial piece of what do we do with dr jones when dr jones brings in x amount of dollars a year and we need dr jones mm -hmm. Which means then the message is usually everybody needs to do whatever they need to do to placate Dr. Jones so that he can keep bringing his patients here. Um, right. 
you know, uh, that might work from the financial end, but I have worked with um, organizations and have said to them, you know, I want you to take a different look at this. I want you to take a look at maybe do a spreadsheet. If Dr. Jones brings in, let's say, $5 million a year um, and you have a turnover rate, let's say he's a surgeon. So you have a turnover rate of your perioperative team and you, you can't, you know, hire a perioperative nurse with a $10,000 bill and a gun, you know, mm -hmm. um, then what is, how much is Dr. Jones actually costing you? So when you yeah. do that analysis of how much they keep saying he generates this amount of income, but he costs this much to keep, right. it's a very different situation. And of course, we do have human resource laws um, that are supposed to guarantee, you know, um, zero tolerance and that can bring a boatload of lawsuits down the pike now that people are taking very seriously. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate that stance on zero tolerance. And I have heard stories of organizations biting the bullet and saying, right. you know what, it, it's, it's costing us too much and it's the right thing to do. And um, they decide yeah. to not tolerate that behavior anymore. But then that but surgeon you, might find a home someplace else where they're going to bring that, that's true. money and, um, and misery, maybe. I'm sure they will for a period of time. And of course, that whole other scenario, it'll rear its ugly head again. But, you know, to your point of, you know, how does this start? Well, the children who bullied in grammar school went to high school and bullied. And, the, and then they went to college and bullied. And then they graduated mm. and went into the workplace. And that behavior keeps going. So yeah. this is not you know, again, it's not the piece of the person being targeted that then targets. Mm -hmm. This this is a group of individuals that have a personality disorder, a narcissistic mm -hmm. personality mm -hmm. disorder that is destructive in the workplace, and that it truly needs to be. I I believe it is a leadership imperative to be able to assess it, to know that you're dealing with a bully versus someone who's chronically uncivil, and then to be able to craft a plan with administration and human resources that effectively uh, manages this problem to the door. Because again, with bullying, there is no remediation. You're not turning this person around. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they, need, they need some sort of help. Um, and that help is likely not going to come from HR or their manager, is what you're saying. So I, I'm not going to say they don't need help, but the first step in, in um, helping someone is they have to identify that there's a problem and own it. And mm -hmm. a narcissist is incapable of mm -hmm. that. Wow. What happens or what would your advice be when it's a senior leader who is a bully? I'm not going to go anywhere near naming names or states here, but I worked at a client once, a health system, where people used the word bully referring to the chief executive officer and there were mm -hmm. stories and mm -hmm. I was never um, directly witness to it, but it was believable. Um, and that seemed to really create a toxic environment that enabled and, um, you know, it just set such a bad example. What, what would your advice be if like, if you're talking to a nurse executive who said, you know, boy, our CEO is a bully. Mm -hmm. So what can they you know do? So you, you would have to keep very good anecdotal notes of dates and times because what you're trying to do again is establish a pattern of behavior that's not just targeted at you but targeted at others. Maybe this mm -hmm. person is disruptive towards other senior execs in the organization. Maybe they were intolerant of a, a family complaint. But you, you would have to try to keep some anecdotal notes um, for yourself but you'd also have to have a, a moment with yourself that understanding the or having some organizational awareness. Um, if this person is extremely powerful and visible, I, you have to understand that everybody knows that this person's a bully. And at some point, the the service that they offer the organization outweighs anybody caring about the behavior. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but it's real. And sure. you need to be able then to either say the serenity prayer and, and decide you're going to stay and just put up with it, or you're gonna advocate for yourself and say, I deserve better and move on. But if you honestly believe that you are going to change someone who's already entrenched in the culture of an organization and is visible and in a leadership position, 
um, you, you're kind of like Don Quixote taking on windmills and you, you could mm -hmm. destroy your career in the process. And mm -hmm. I, I really would encourage people to give that some very long deliberate thought before you did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, boy, I mean, the, the, and the consequences, I mean, I pause because the consequences of a lot of this behavior and, and the culture that that leads to in healthcare, I think could arguably be tied to the quality of care and, and even patient safety. I mean, this, there, there are really high stakes in environments. That's like this. right. And, and um, the accrediting or the oversight bodies, you know, like the, the Joint Commission, which is, a, mm -hmm. you know, one of the, the highest um, uh, accrediting bodies of quality in a healthcare organization, um, came out in 2016 with a white paper talking about disruptive behavior. Mm -hmm. And it was it was a very strongly worded paper, white paper, because when when the Joint Commission was trying to address what we call sentinel events, okay, right. so these were mistakes with consequences to the patient, not just right. a near miss, but it, a definite consequence to the patient. That started around 2000, and um, the Joint Commission asked a lot of healthcare leaders, well, what is it all about? And a lot of those people said, well, it's about communication. We're a diverse population. Um, we have various levels of education. We need to be able to streamline the way we communicate. So we, we did just that. We, we looked at the nuclear in industry. We looked at the military. Mm -hmm. We brought in um, different ways to be able to communicate or report events. Um, there was something called team steps that came up that were supposed yeah. to help mm -hmm. us explain that we were concerned about um, a possible um, change in the patient's status, and it was supposed to have key words in there that got your attention. Right. And then over 10 or 12 years, the Sentinel events didn't change. And when the Joint Commission took another look at that, what they realized was it wasn't that people weren't ready, able to communicate accurately their concern. It's that there wasn't an environment where they felt safe in reporting that concern. Right. So that's when they started to turn their attention towards um, disruptive behavior as really being the ideology of a lot of distraction that then causes errors, which do right. harm. Right. And, and that, that phrase, psychological safety, is an important one. Um, are you familiar with the work of Professor Amy Edmondson from Harvard? I'm not. She is, she's written a lot about psychological safety, and she was involved in studies in healthcare. I'll, uh, I'll shoot you some uh, links to, to her That'd be work great. On, Thank you. on that. And um, I'm hoping, I, I've interviewed her in a different podcast, I'm hoping to bring her onto this series. And, and talk about um, you know this idea of learning from mistakes and doing so requires that we, and I think this is where the title of your book resonates with me, bringing shadow behavior into the light of day. Whether right. that behavior is in the shadows or whether there are safety or quality risks that are in the shadows, if we don't make it psychologically safe for people to speak up, we, we yes. can't. We can't do anything about it. So I was wondering that, if you could that, elaborate on right. what leaders can do to make yeah. it safe, not just say you need to bring this behavior to light right. in a way that might be risky. So I, th I think the number one thing that leaders can do um, is really be visible. All right. That, you know, the, the whole idea of leading from behind your desk has come and gone. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we learned this even through the pandemic. The staff that saw their leaders the most often was the staff that had the greatest sense of um, backing and it really helped their resilience. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the staff needs to see you. The staff needs to know that you're concerned. You have to take a look at your staff. You're, when you do rounding, you're not just going to meet and greet your patients and perhaps their families, but you want to ask your staff, how's it going? You know, what's going on and so on. And you're going to start to notice a little bit of a pattern. You know, you want to, you want to take a look at sit with your departmental leaders, look at time and attendance, and, and look at the fundamentals. So as I shared with you before, there's two types of disruptive behavior. So somebody who's chronically uncivil is that person who can never get to work on time. You know, they can't get back from break on time. They can never do their work independently. Uh, there's always an excuse. And then, of course, when you're trying to collect your thoughts and have a cup of coffee, all they want to do is talk about their personal life. They're just and they have low emotional intelligence and they don't realize that it is work and effort to be around them in the workplace. But yeah. they are not 
trying to cause harm to you. They're not trying to target you, belittle you, abuse you, or make you feel less um, capable and competent. They're just have no awareness and insight. Yeah. Um, you, you really have to work with those souls and make sure that they understand that that's just unacceptable because the amount of attention and wear and tear that takes on the staff is incredible. And again, these, pat these behaviors have patterns to them and it's always something. And you know, you want to get in there early and especially yeah. with your new hires, you know, there's usually a probationary period and it might be three months. I'm an advocate for the six month probationary period because you know even when you're dating someone everybody can be good for three months six months usually <laughs> tells you if you got a winner or not you know so you want to you want to sure. date your employee for six months and not three months before you decide to take the next step um, be with the bullying behavior though um, one of the key assessment findings I have for this narcissist with a license, it's this bully, is that they, they are so enthralled with themselves and they feel that they're so very, very special that they, mm -hmm. they demand special accommodations. They will talk about their seniority a lot. They will talk about mm -hmm. what they do. They will talk about, you know, you can't orient somebody if, it's, if I don't orient them. You know, if mm -hmm. I don't say they're good enough, they're not good enough. And you might think that's a joke, but it's not. They're trying to yeah. tell you something. Um, they will also leapfrog authority. And that is the number one, I believe, hallmark sign of a bully is that you'll have a staff person and you'll have a middle manager. And their view of the middle manager is, well, you can't be any good because you're just a middle manager. Mm, you know, gosh. so they leapfrog the middle manager and either go to the director or the administrator. Mm -hmm. um, and they're notorious for that. And you can restate structure all you want, but they honestly believe that they're so special that the only person who can understand what they're saying is someone in yeah. power who is special too. Mm -hmm. So if you've got someone like that, you probably have a bully. You probably have a bully who could care less if they hurt your feelings, you know, leapfrog, broke protocol. It's all about them and how it serves them. Yeah. And so, um, Phyllis, you know, you told your story about being a leader and now you're, you know, through your book and through your consulting and coaching, you're trying to help other leaders. You know, I like in, in the description of the book and what you do, um, you know, you're not blaming people for being bad managers. You're pointing out maybe a lack of training or a lack of development. So if you could share or a little bit more about that. You're just a professional caregiver and you, you care a lot, <laughs> you know. So the, the piece is, is, no, this is not about a bad manager and this is certainly right. not about a dysfunctional leadership structure. What this right. is, is really understanding what you're looking at. So... Quite honestly, for all the education we have as healthcare providers, except for our sainted colleagues in behavioral health, we get very little training on behavior. And, you know, if even in an emergency department, which is my clinical specialty, if I was to say to someone, do you, do you want three gunshot wounds or do you want someone who's emotionally disturbed or having a, a, an anxiety attack? most nurses will go for the gunshot wounds because we're not really good at managing aberrant behavior or disruptive behavior. People yeah. back away from that. So what we need to do is really bring up our knowledge base about what we're dealing with. Once you understand that a bully is a narcissist and you start to make yourself more aware, which is what I did along the way, is train myself and, and really become astute in how narcissists think and therefore act. Well, then you, it's like understanding a disease. You're getting ahead of it now. You know how to plan for it. Yeah. You know how to anticipate. You know what works and you know what doesn't so that you not only assess better, you mm -hmm. assess and then intervene earlier and you put your plan in place that's airtight so that once you get this person to the door, it stands up against arbitration. Yeah. Wow. Um, so with the book, and again, our, our guest is Phyllis Quinlan. She's uh, a nurse. She has a PhD in healthcare administration. And the book is titled Bringing Shadow Behavior into the Light of Day. Do you think there's, or have you seen, is there a broader audience for the book beyond healthcare leaders? Unfortunately, yes. Um, yeah. You know, uh, bullies exist in every work venue. 
um, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of a place that bullying doesn't exist. So um, I think now, especially as we're coming out of this pandemic and we're restructuring um, and everybody's trying to figure out what the workplace is going to look like, um, I, I think that we really have to lean into trying to create the healthiest workplace that we possibly can. And of course, that means you want to focus on communication and collaboration, making sure you recognize your people appropriately. If you, but if you are just focused on that environmental, how things operationalize, you're going to miss a big piece because making sure that disruptive behavior isn't pervasive on your department. And Mark, I just want to make a point. You could have, you know, 25, 30 nurses in a department. All you need is one or two to bully. And that it will be very, very disruptive to that department. And, um, you know, so it, you know, you really want to stay on top of that. And the, 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 the 85% of the staff that's really waiting for leadership to take charge and do something um, is, you know, kind of like the silent majority. And then mm -hmm. it's amazing once you take care of one thing and really get that person out, the energy in your department will be so refreshed. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, like, you know, you know, the end of the war. You know what I mean? Peace at last. And, <laughs> you see you people's know, mood lighten really, up. Really, like the that engagement how, scores like, go yeah. up. The staff interacts yeah. better with, with patients um, and or customers, depending on what your, you know, your, uh, your business is. Um, mm -hmm. But, boy, the time and effort it takes to do the right thing to make sure that you have zero tolerance for disruptive behavior, and it's not just a piece of paper, but actually an action plan, will pay off in staff engagement and all of your other quality metrics going up. It's truly worth the effort. Yeah. Well, thank you for your efforts and, and thank you for what you're doing um, to help others. I mean, it really makes a big difference. Um, so Phyllis's website, if you want to learn more about her work, is mfwconsultants.com. Um, again, the book is Bringing Shadow Behavior into the Light of Day, and I'll put those links um, into the show notes. Um, so Phyllis, thank you for you know sharing some of your reflections as, as a leader of how you um, learned and grew and developed. And, and, and thankfully, you know, you, as you said, a favorite mistake is something that you learned from. And it sounds like in this case, it was a, a real springboard for you to, um, to go and help others. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for giving me this forum to help try to raise awareness and make sure that you know the the real frontline caregivers can do their job seamlessly and with peace of mind because they're all looking to really give world-class patient care yeah and thank you for everything you're doing to um, help get some of those um, you know barriers out of the way so people can really do that that's what they want to do that's the, that's the one thing i love about healthcare is you have so many amazing people and um, you know we need to make sure that they're set up for success instead of being dragged down that's there you really go. Important. So thank you so much, Phyllis, uh, for being a guest here today. Really interesting. My pleasure, Mark.